Are we recording? What's up, YouTube? All right, so this is video number two um, of this, like, I don't think it's really a YouTube series, but video number two. Today I'm going to be talking about and putting some, hopefully, like, doing a little video editing as well. Um, I would say it's sort of like, okay, state of the union. Where am I at with respect to coding? Uh, I talked a little bit last time about why I'm trying to learn to code, um, why I think it's important. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've done so far, as far as like learning to code, um, how it's gone, what I'm thinking, and you'll find out sooner rather than later, but by no means do I have any of this figured out. I would say right now, actually I feel pretty uncertain as to where this is all going to take me, uh, and I'm trying to figure that out. I really am. I'm, I'm thinking a lot about it every day. Um, I recently made a big pivot. So yeah, let's talk about where I'm at. How much do I know about, let's say programming, coding. Um, how and we're back. Okay, so let's see here. When did I first start learning to code? Well, my first real exposure was probably, well, actually taking it all the way back. Um, back in college, um, I went to school at Stanford, for those of you, you who do not know. Um, at Stanford, there was a massive emphasis on computer science. It wasn't as big as it is now. I've heard that CS became like the most popular major, but there was a decent emphasis on computer science. And as part of my original major, before I switched majors, um, we had to take computer science uh, fundamentals. So we took what they used to call CS, I think it was 106A and 106B. Um, and it was in, I think, C++ or some like, or Java or some super rudimentary coding language. But we did explore basic concepts of a lot of coding primitives. So things like um, what is a variable, what is an array, what is a hash or whatever you want to call it, object in JavaScript. Um, so we explored some primitives, so I had some exposure to that. We also did end up writing a decent amount of code. Um, and uh, actually like handwriting a lot of code too, but that was like our finals and stuff were actually handwritten code. But um, we did learn a little bit about recursion and some more advanced concepts, um, but it was very, very high level. Like we did, actually, you know, one thing we did end up building now that I'm thinking about it was we ended up building a, what is it called when you have like the little slider thing at the bottom and you like bounce a ball up and like destroy bricks? Oh, I have to Google this now because now I don't know. Um, let's see, old school video game with slider at the bottom, bouncing ball. Ooh, I think it's called Breakout. Yes, Breakout, exactly. Cool, so yeah, it was Breakout. Um, and we coded that out, but that was a lot of fun. We built like bonuses and stuff into it. Um, so that was my very first exposure, but pretty much like that was just for my major, you know, it was like one of like, oh, check the box and then move on. So I knew a little bit about coding primitives. I knew a little bit, tiny bit about programming, but it didn't really matter for my job. Um, my first job actually uh, was in finance. So in college, I interned twice, two summers at Goldman Sachs. And I interned at a hedge fund uh, separately with some really amazing guys um, who are actually really into crypto now. And we'll get to that uh, at some other, probably other video. Um, so I did a little bit of coding in college. Um, nothing serious. Um, didn't, didn't feel particularly fond of it. Didn't feel like, oh, this is like my calling or anything. And I think too, it's important to, when I think back to that time and maybe why I didn't attach myself to it as much is, a, I was just a lot more ego driven. Like I was younger and I wanted to like feel like I was really, really good at whatever I was doing. And there was just some like, you know, Stanford man, like there's coding geniuses out there. And my roommate in particular actually was a brilliant computer scientist, um, freshman year, like really weird guy, but brilliant computer scientist. And, uh, and so he kind of also, like it was a good sort of foil. I was like, I don't like it anywhere near as much as he does. So let's just do it and get it over with. <clears throat> so that was that. And then fast forward, I was 2012, I graduated from college, so I probably did something in like 2008 or 9 or 10. 2012 I graduate college, and I go off to Goldman Sachs, and I'm doing my like trading career. I wasn't a trader, I was a salesperson. Um, 
So I'm on Wall Street for a couple years, and this is when I start like kindling a passion for startups, mostly, well not mostly, I'd always loved the startup idea, the community, like I always thought it was really cool and that was my dream to be an entrepreneur. Um, and at Goldman, I ended up hating my job so much that I was like, I gotta get out, I gotta get out. Um, I ended up interviewing with a couple of bigger startups. Um, one was Palantir, and I interviewed with Palantir, and they actually asked me like some technical questions, or they told me they were gonna ask me some technical questions. So I had reviewed a little bit of JavaScript, I had reviewed a little bit of code for that. It went okay, I mean, I think I did all right. Um, there are ways to like talk about algorithms and things that don't involve writing any code or knowing syntax. That was 2013, 14, I'm like starting to think, hey, this is pretty cool, like maybe, you know, maybe code is gonna be part of my journey. I think if startups are gonna be part of the journey, then tech broadly, like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but still, like I wasn't, I hadn't written any code, I wasn't paying attention. I was trying to think about how to, ways to start a business, um, but I wasn't thinking about writing any code. So that was 2014. I quit Goldman 2014 and started, um, sort of joined a mentor of mine. So actually one of the guys who had, was running the hedge fund that I had previously interned for, he was starting a startup. And that startup was in fantasy football. And so basically what he did to get this company off the ground was like most jabronis, he, uh, or most like, you know, wealthy jabronis, he, uh, he raised a bunch of money. So he already had like $500,000 in the bank. Hadn't done anything, just like, Talked to his friends, they gave him 500 grand. Had 500,000 bucks or more. And uh, talked to a bunch of engineers at Stanford, so like a combination of both undergrads and uh, recent graduates. He's like, all right, I got a bunch of Stanford engineers. So these are computer scientists and we're gonna build this iPhone app. So the whole company was like, we're gonna build an iPhone app that stands next to FanDuel and DraftKings at the time. This was like right at the beginning of the daily fantasy boom. And we're gonna build this fantasy app and we're gonna pull data from ESPN and we're gonna pull data from Yahoo Fantasy and we're gonna pull all this data and we're gonna create this this sort of platform. Um, and the whole point of it was to, um, actually originally the, the idea had changed so many times but the idea we settled on was pull in all of your fantasy leagues into one place, allow you to use those teams in other matchups. So like you play someone week one, you wanna play them again in week two, well you do on our platform because Yahoo doesn't support like you know, that. It was a whole disaster. I mean, this is when I really cut my teeth though because what happened is in this in the company, okay, so we had the company of like five people. It was like myself, the CEO, one other guy, and then we had like all the engineers was that none of us knew anything about programming, let, let alone mobile, you know, iOS native app programming, let alone having to pull data from all these third parties, which we had no relationship with. Um, so we had to like, you know, use APIs where they were available. At the time I didn't know what an API was, but use some publicly available APIs, but mostly scrape all the data and scrape all the data relatively real time because, or relatively, you know, once a day or something, we had to pull all this data into our platform and make sure that if you made a change in your league, if you traded somebody, if you had, you know, whatever, waved somebody that it actually came into our platform. So. At the time, I had no appreciation for the complexity of the problem we were trying to solve, but I was the most technical of all the people in the company, and I also liked working with the engineers, and I liked learning about what we were trying to do. And so, even just getting my hands around the problem and understanding, like, why is it hard? Why is this so hard? You know, and, and one of the first things I learned about was APIs and why, for example, not having a public API to access this data was so much more challenging. Uh, why it would continually break because these platforms were making a lot of changes uh, to their, you know, front ends and. By nature, our scraper, if it was talking to their front end, they didn't give a shit about us, so it would break all the time. Um, and that was like, you know, a year and a half journey of a lot of pain. Um, not so much dedicated learning. I mean, I, I would kind of stop and start, like, should I just, like, go take a course on iOS, you know? But at the time, I just didn't really feel like that was what I wanted to do, and I guess I, I was happy to kind of sit in the middle of the two parties, but... Ultimately, you know, the lesson for me coming out of that year and a half, which, you know, we ended up launching a product finally after 15 months and burning a million dollars, never really got any traction. Um, really the lesson was like, if I really wanted, if I really wanted, if I could do it over again, to be valuable inside of this really early stage startup, uh, the only way, I, the, the way I could have added the most value was to actually get my hands into the code um, or help solve the technical problems. like. For example, one of the most challenging problems was getting a payment processor um, because we were in like gambling. So we couldn't use Stripe and we couldn't use PayPal. And so 
I always kind of, not felt bad, but I always thought that it was kind of a shame that we had really smart people on the non-technical side of the house. So let's say like marketing, they couldn't contribute. And it just felt kind of pathetic. Like, you know, we were ready to do this like marketing campaign and we had guns ready to like to fire on the promotional front, but the app didn't work the way we wanted it to work. And I think that all stemmed from a lack of technical understanding of what we were asking of these engineers. These engineers being young, not, not being the most sophisticated. Um, we ended up bringing in like a CTO guy who was a really, really incredible engineer. And he did his best and he did a lot better job than the other ones. But even then, like the business wasn't well thought out because we weren't appreciating the technical challenges. So yeah, that was a big lesson for me. And a lesson that like, I want to work with engineers and I want to be technical, but maybe I don't want to write code yet. So I'm still like thinking I can kind of manage in between and and that's for some people but you know if you're watching this you're probably like me and that you, you might be seeing kind of the progression here so that was 2015 2016 and i got pretty crushed by that startup when it went down i was pretty down in the dumps i hadn't focused on any particular skill set like i wasn't really a product manager and i wasn't really a marketer and i wasn't really a you know whatever anything and so then i had to go through kind of this very rough period from from my life when I had to kind of start from scratch. So I'd been at Goldman Sachs. I had start. I was a you know early stage startup guy. Um, I went to actually a second early stage startup. Um, went through 500 startups. So that was like you know job number three. Um, <clears throat> but that one was really again that was born out of desperation. When when the the fantasy company went down, I was like holy crap! I don't know what to do. <clears throat> and I had a meta guy in New York who was going to go through this accelerator. And so I just attached myself to him for like three months for the accelerator program. And, uh, and that was another, like, I guess when I think back on it now, it was another experience <clears throat> being around a lot of people, <clears throat> excuse me, being around a lot of people who knew how to code and a lot of them actually being self-taught, which was another really cool thing was to see kids who had t taught themselves to code to the extent they could build a company around it. One, the guys actually in particular who impressed me the most was the guy from Rap Chat. His name's Seth. He's the CEO. Uh, great guy like had no technical background, taught himself everything he needed to know to build an, I an iPhone app. And look at like my experience coming out of the fantasy app where I couldn't do anything and he had done this whole thing himself. <clears throat> I was very impressed by that. So, but that experience again, wasn't very good for me. Um, the job was really weird. It, it just really was a tough situation. But again, I'm like around all these people who are building really cool things, software, especially almost all, um, and had been that taught themselves to be technical. So <clears throat> I spent a little bit of time doing self-study again, but I think I still hadn't kind of hit bottom at this point with regard to like where my non-technical startup career was going. I still kind of thought that <clears throat> I was heading in the right direction, that I would just, I hadn't found the right opportunity yet. And that once I found the right opportunity, I would sort of maximize like this business development, ambiguous skill set that I felt I had, um, with which I may or may not have had, it's not clear. So we go from there, that's job number three. Then we go to kind of, this is the rock bottom part where I'm like, okay, I've been through two startups. I've been at Goldman. I don't really know where I'm like skill set wise progressing toward. Let me, let me kind of go back to my roots and get back into sales. And it kind of sucked. I, I just felt like I was making this decision out of proximity and not out of desire. Um, but I didn't really see any other options. And I was 25, um, so I was young, 25, 26. Um, so I was still young and I felt like I could still kind of build myself back up. So I ended up taking an entry level for those of you who know what it is, an SDR position um, at a tech company in San Francisco that was building uh, e-commerce automation software. So something like an email marketing tool, only like way more technical and way more robust. Um, and I was pretty early there. Um, they're, they're probably like worth a billion dollars now. They, they were they were small when I got there. Um, and I was an entry level salesperson. So one of the things that was cool about the job <clears throat> was that I was sort of asked to be more technical again. And I was like, great, this is actually fun. Um, and so through that role, I started talking to the founders a lot and they were amazing guys. They really, the founders were really good to me. Um, the eventual, really tough part, actually maybe this isn't rock bottom yet, the rock bottom is when I got fired from this job, um, was when they hired like a new head of sales and he kind of blew up everything I was working toward, but okay, I'm in a tech company in SF, we sell this really complex technical product, I sort of was able to work with the founders and they were really good guys, I was like guys, if you can just help me get a little more technical, I can do a better job in sales. So they actually paid for me to do a part-time course with General Assembly in JavaScript, and this is now, we're probably in 2016 or 17 now, 16 I think. 
16. Um, and so I actually was attending, like, I think a couple nights a week um, in person in San Francisco, uh, JavaScript workshop. Super fun. Um, I really enjoyed myself. It kind of reminded me of college. It, remind, it was like another opportunity to learn. It was free, <laughs> more or less. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the work and there were some cool people in there and so I had a genuinely a really good time. Um, did it help me in my job? Eh, I don't really know. Um, but I, I was, was kind of like, oh, this is really fun again. And so um, I enjoyed that and then I got fired from that job. And that's another story, but got fired because I just really wasn't happy being so junior and the new boss. And the trajectory of the company, again, this is again like where I struggled, was the trajectory of the company was going crazy but I wasn't contributing to it. And the people who contributed the most were like these very senior sales guys who were doing these massive deals, which I wasn't really prepared for, or the engineers who were building this amazing, amazing product. So not being one of those people, I felt I always felt like I was a tiny little cog in this great machine and I didn't feel at all fulfilled by the growth. So I, would, I didn't behave very well and I got fired. So that's like probably rock bottom. <laughs> So it wasn't like a fired, fired, fired. I'm at the bottom of the barrel here. Um, and I had, again, wet my beak in JavaScript. Um, I took a job remote at a company called Sumo. Um, and Sumo was amazing. It was like my first really good job. Um, and that was, again, kind of like a medium technical product. Um, it was software for sure. And I was around a lot of really smart engineers again. <clears throat> and I had kind of the same experience where I was sort of flirting with learning to code. I talked to some of our you know, senior engineers. A lot of them had side projects going. Um, a lot of them were building things on the side. I just said that. Um, and I again kind of wet my beak, my interest again. And, and this time I actually went deeper. I learned more about how the product worked, how it integrated, what an integration meant, got deeper into my understanding of APIs, deeper into my understanding of HTML, of CSS, because it was like a visual thing. And that was fantastic, great job for me. Um, <clears throat> still was doing sales, but you know, more technical. Um, started doing a little bit of marketing. So like it was like, not only would I sell them the product, but I would kind of put my marketing hat on and say, oh, here's how you use it to grow your business. Like that's what marketers do. Um, and kind of, it was all mixed in with, you know, software and technical understanding. So that was a great year. And then I eventually, I quit Sumo uh, because I wanted to go full time into, uh, marketing itself and and I, th I thought at the time this is 2018 I thought at the time I'm like oh I'm gonna go all in on marketing and build up like a marketing so I'm gonna go all in on marketing consulting and I'm gonna do like all this great stuff and build up you know this skill set and actually I really did like marketing I do like marketing I still love it um, so I quit my job and I moved to Portland and I'm like okay I have a little bit of a sales skill set a little bit of a marketing skill set I had really gotten to know Shopify really gotten to know Clavio, Google Analytics, all that stuff. Um, so I started doing a little bit of freelance marketing and um, and all that sort of progressed over 2018 where I really just focused on marketing. Um, but the thing about being in e-commerce, which was really cool for me was, again, I'm the most technical person in the room. E-commerce founders tend to be really two types. Either they're great marketers um, or they're great product people, but they're not usually like software engineers. So I was always the most technical person in the room and that was awesome. 2018. Okay. Now we come to the real, I'm sorry, that was a long winded like career walkthrough, but it's the same theme, always flirting with it, working in technical products, working close to, you know, using code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, actually doing a course. But then we get 2019. 2019 is where everything changed. So 2019 is when I, so late 2018, I should say, I'm ramping up my like marketing career. I got a you know huge opportunity with this company called Perfect Keto to be my marketing client for my little consultancy. Um, they're a big company. They're growing super fast. Uh, I quoted them a lot of money, and actually it was a friend from Sumo who had gone to work there, and so. I was just really feeling like everything was going my way. Like everything was coming up, Billy Boy. Um, I was getting this new marketing client which was gonna pay me a lot of money. I was living in Portland at the time and I hated it. So I was gonna move to Denver, new client, a bunch of money. Um, everything was going, was coming up Will. And there's this guy on Twitter who I had just interacted with in a variety of ways, um, who was, name is Ryan Culp. And you know, I really am grateful for him. And he had been talking a lot about this idea of sort of this honest marketer renaissance man program. And Ryan is a self-taught coder, 
in the Shopify e-commerce world, which is how I got to know him because I had been in that world now for two years, he was a self-taught programmer who owned a portfolio of Shopify apps and, ver and a variety of companies who made a lot of money, did it his own way, and most importantly, did not give a fuck. And as someone who had previously been sort of ousted out of a company for misbehaving, um, who had felt, I had felt sort of marginalized in, in varieties of ways, not because of anything like, I'm not talking about like marginalized, like, you know, ethnicity, I'm talking about, I'm not the stud of the company. I'm not the man at the top and, and I really wanted to be the leader. So looking at someone who had like built this portfolio and, and he said like, I can build, I can sell, I can do it all. I was like, fuck yeah, that's what I want. That's exactly what I want. I'm tired of just being a sales guy. I'm tired of, you know, like being in awe of engineers. I want to be the man. <laughs> um, so, and in business, in order to be the man, you have to become the man. You don't have to beat the man. So to become the man, Ryan had this whole program. His whole program was, hey, I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna help you learn to code, I'm gonna mentor you, I'm gonna give you resources, and we're gonna turn you into an entrepreneur. And I'm like, oh my God, I have to apply to this program. So I wrote to Ryan and I applied, there were like 200 and something applications for three spots. And I remember I had just gotten Perfect Keto as a client, um, like just starting out, and I just felt like this, powerful sense that I was meant to get this scholarship. I, I don't know why, but I was just like, you know, things are starting to go my way, like really starting to go my way. And so I wrote to him and I wrote everything that I talked to you guys about just now that, and Ryan had felt the same way, you know, I'm a marketer working with engineers and I feel inferior to them and they're the ones that are valuable in Silicon Valley and they're the ones that are doing great things and I'm over here like a piece of crap and I'm, I'm tired of sitting on the sidelines. I'm tired of, you know, not doing, not fulfilling my potential. I'm tired of not being able to do it all. And I just wrote, and I, and I expressed a lot of the emotion that I hopefully expressed here, like that I just felt I had more in me. And for whatever reason, I think probably ego for the most part, I had never pursued like really learning to, to program. <clears throat> so then Ryan actually accepted me. I was one of the three guys who were put into the program. Um, and, uh, and so 2019, I started not only working with Perfect Keto and, and really like leveling up huge, huge, huge on the marketing side. Uh, this is for, you know, Perfect Keto was a Shopify store. I was like really leveling up and learning a crap about shop, <laughs> crap, learning a ton about Shopify. Um, and even like just broadly, like this incredible job. I mean, that was, I had been, and maybe will forever be the best job I ever had. Um, I also was into the program. So what did that mean? What did it mean in 2019? I was enrolled in launch school, which I'm gonna hopefully like show you guys a little bit. Ryan bought me launch school. So I was in a programming online uh, self-paced, online, mastery based, self paced uh, course. And we had regular monthly check-ins, we had book reports and we had deadlines. And so for about the first half of 2019, it was fantastic. I got through the Ruby fundamentals, backend fundamentals. Um, you know, my new job was kind of demanding, so I wasn't maybe going as fast as I would have liked, but I met Ryan's deadlines for like the fundamentals. Um, we did book reports, we did a lot of mentorship, like digitally, and I was really excited. And I was like, yes, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Um, I'm learning to code. And it was all true. I was learning to code. Um, you know, at times it, it felt a little, I don't know, boring because we're just doing like, here's an array, here's how to loop through an array, here's how to, you know, uh, whatever, map an array, all that kind of stuff, iterators and all these different very simple, simple coding primitives. Um, and at the time I just felt like it was getting, it wasn't getting old broadly, but the material itself was getting a little old. And, and Ryan did his best to help us, but you know, one of those things, man, it just, I never felt that emotional engagement in the material beyond wanting to do right by Ryan. I just didn't, I wasn't able to get myself invested in the right way. And eventually, you know, over time, as you can imagine, you know, you're in this program and people are giving you these things for free and holding you accountable at first, and then they let you go. And over 2019, I kind of just didn't stick with it enough. Like I would, you know, I didn't create the right study schedule. I didn't have a vision for where I wanted to take it. I didn't know what I was going to do with it all. And I think one of the big reasons for that, and even now I still struggle with that sometimes. No, I still struggle with it was that Ryan was very good about building all kinds of businesses. And I think of Ryan a little more like, uh, like a mercenary where he was just like flying around the internet, picking up all these awesome 
dollar opportunities and I had decided at the time and still today a little bit that like I'd gotten into this supplement company that was an e-commerce business and I really loved like wellness, you know, fitness, nutrition, productivity, da 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 da. And that was kind of the sphere I wanted to live in. So I was like, I have to blend software with this particular niche and I didn't see an overlap yet. So, you know, I was just burning time, like writing. And, and to be fair, launch school is a really intense, intense course. Um, it really forces you to learn like the ins and outs and conceptual and the nuance of Ruby or whatever programming language. And so it just moved a lot slower than most other schools. Um, but honestly, like frankly, I just, I didn't stay dedicated enough to it. I didn't commit the right amount of time. I didn't create a study schedule. I kind of let Ryan drive that for me. Um, and it didn't work out well. It didn't go well. And, and it didn't go well for actually any of us in the program, really. Um, so, um, oh shit, I'm running out of battery. So anyway, by the end of the year, I was feeling pretty guilty. I was feeling guilty because I hadn't gotten nearly as far as I probably should have in my head. Uh, Ryan had done this whole journey probably in about six months, but he'd quit his job, moved to Thailand. Um, and so I was like, oh man, I just felt like so bad about it. And so Ryan, Ryan ended up, and the other guys actually were even worse off than me. The other guys in the program hadn't done, hadn't even gotten as far as I had. And Ryan, one in late 2019, logged into our accounts and was like, this is pathetic. And, and he was appropriately harsh, I felt. So I was like, yeah, it is pathetic, but I'll rededicate myself in 2020. So we basically like flushed the program and restarted it in 2020. Um, and this time I was like, I'm dedicated, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Um, but 2020 was a tough year, not because of Corona or anything, but because a lot of drama in my day job started occurring. A lot of things were going wrong. People were getting fired. It was a really dramatic year for me work-wise. Um, also life-wise, like I was breaking up with my girlfriend. Um, so a lot of things I felt were pulling on my mental energy and that feeling of guilt toward having not gotten further, um, really started to hold me back. Cause I would think about programming. It's like one of those things where you're like, Oh, I should have done so much. I don't even want to look at it. And I built up this association over time. And this is like early 2020 with, with the coding school where I would just feel guilty and not want to open it and avoid it and try to procrastinate it. Um, and we had new students. So for a period of time, like the new kids that came in, there was like three of us. Again, I was a carryover from the previous year. We were all invigorated. We were all excited. I was ahead. We were plowing through stuff. Um, but of course it fizzled again. And so one of my, one of my thoughts was like, okay, how do I make this work? I need to figure out a better way, uh, to do this. Um, was, okay, well, I need to take some more drastic measures. Um, but I wasn't prepared or able to quit my full-time job yet. I hadn't saved enough, saved up enough money. So mid, mid 2020, I'm like, okay, that's it. I, or early 2020, I was like, that's it. I'm going to go on one of these like extended travels. So like, I'm going to go do digital nomad life because that's what Ryan did. Um, even though he didn't work, he left and that's going to help me be more productive and focus more on this. What I, what I really think is like the, the true North. Um, versus all these distractions and people and everything else. So I booked a ticket to Argentina. Four months was my plan. Um, but then Corona hit. So that didn't really work out. Uh, so I'm still like making very small incremental progress in code school while in the States. While I'm in Denver, I move home for a little bit. I'm still like dedicated to getting out of the country, dedicated to some kind of travel to focus on code. So I settle. Okay, two months, Mexico. All I'm going to do is like, Go outside, eat, like go outside, enjoy the warm weather, eat, sleep, exercise, code, like, and work. So like, it was like work and life, but life was just gonna be warm weather and coding. And so for a period of time, I, I actually made a YouTube video, you can see it here, it's called Four Month Focus, um, which was intended to be around like the Argentina stuff. Um, I got to Mexico and I was like, all right, goal is three hours a day. Three hours a day of code. I have plenty of time. There's no one here that I know. There's no distractions. There's no like pull on my time. I'm just gonna do work and code. And you know, I remember logging my time when I was there. I actually did make a decent amount of progress. I did pass another sort of like chapter of, of the book, so to speak. I did an interview and passed. Um, it was very challenging. But again, same thing happened after about a month and a week, you know, in my second month, I really started fizzling out. I lost my momentum. I stopped doing coding every day. And I remember thinking to myself like, oh man, like launch school is great, but it's just, it's so much. And, uh, 
at this time at least I had formed a vision for what I wanted to build with the coding. I wanted to build a Shopify app. I still would like to, but um, I had a vision, so I had a, I had a desire, but um, I didn't. I just didn't have the right psychology. And it's one thing that I've really learned, you know, over these last let's call it two years of like actually dedicated attempt to learn to code. Uh, is that I developed this this mindset where when I thought about programming, when I thought about the learning, that's the thing that I, I felt deeply was leading me in the right direction. So that was my head. Like logically I was like, yes, it's the right direction, but emotionally I just felt nothing but guilt. And I, I think when I, I think I read this book called, ooh, I forget, oh, I forget what it was called. It's on my blog, but it was all about this metaphor of behavior as like a path, a rider, and an elephant. And uh, the relationship between our emotional self, our logical self, and sort of the, the like paths that we have in life that we carve and can sort of manicure. Um, and when I realized I had let my emotional self become so overwhelmed by guilt, by shame, um, by lack of progress, that he was holding back my logic. And so the second month in Mexico or the rest of the second month in Mexico, I said, no more, no more pressure. If I feel like coding and I, want, and I feel like it's gonna be fun, I will do it, but I will no longer, no longer worry about the past. Like that's the past. At the same time, um, Ryan had come to us as like a mentorship group where he was paying for our code school and what have you, and said that he was, he, he had been actually like absent for a couple months. Um, it was corona time. It was coronavirus time. Things were weird. I just felt like I didn't want to bother him. But he had some ups and downs, I think. And uh, he came to us and was like, "Guys, I don't know where this program is going. None of you are checked our code schools again. Our progress. None of you are where I thought you would be." Rightfully, he was right. And so I think he was. I could feel he was starting to think about winding down the program. Um, and I, I, I don't blame him. So, so then he ended up winding it down um after i got back from mexico he's like guys i'm i'm ending this it's not really working like you have none of you like it, you know we didn't become entrepreneurs in the way that we all said we wanted to um and in fact i'm trying to think i don't think the other guys i think the other guys are still working full-time jobs actually um not that i'm ahead of them or anything but yeah like it didn't work so it was an experiment and it didn't work it's okay when ryan shut it down i realized like I'm at a crossroads and I distinctly remember like getting back from Mexico and having these thoughts when I was in Portland. I was like, okay, I had something that sort of fed my appetite for entrepreneurship and programming, um, but I didn't invest the time in it that I should have. It was just like a crutch. It was like, so long as I have this program with Ryan and it's alive, I'm in it, I'm, I'm progressing. No, it was more like I'm in it and I'm investing in it, I'm progressing, but I wasn't investing in it in the right amounts, but I had begun to sort of unravel the psychology that I stopped feeling guilty about not programming. I stopped feeling guilty that I, some days I didn't do anything. And I started to look for more association with happiness. Like when I would break, when I would learn a new concept, when I had a small business idea, when I actually ended up building a couple of really fun front end websites, learning some more CSS, learning some Tailwind, um, I started to find some joy in the process. So that was when things really shifted for me. So Ryan shuts it down and I'm like, okay, I'm still working this full-time job. It's not going that great anymore. Um, I saved up a bunch of money when traveling and I was like, this is a crossroads. And I either, I'm gonna go right and I'm gonna say, you know what, program is just not for me. I don't wanna be the Renaissance man. I don't wanna do it all. I'm gonna focus on marketing and make that my career and crush that, great. Or I had to go kind of blow everything up again. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm back. I'm obviously look different. I just went to the gym because my camera died. So let's just fix one thing real quick here actually. Okay, cut here. Um, okay, so I'm back. I went to the gym actually. Um, I just got home because uh, my camera died. So I was like, all right, I'll charge the camera, I'll go to the gym, come back, finish the video. Um, so I was just talking about being at a crossroads and it being between going fully into marketing and sort of letting, I wouldn't say letting it go, but just recognizing that it wasn't the right path for me to try to pursue coding professionally and maybe more as a hobby or something that I can be kind of good at, but not like full force. And the question I just asked, like, 
and I couldn't say, I couldn't resist was, is this going to keep coming up? Am I going to keep wanting to learn, keep wanting to learn? And what else, what have I not done yet? And the one thing that I hadn't done was I hadn't made it my full-time job. <laughs> That's the only thing I hadn't tried. I did it in college. I did it part-time. I did it nights and weekends. I was in a program. There was formalized accountability. All that was there. I just didn't take it full-time. And a lot of my friends who did the boot camps, the boot camp model, the general model is you take time off from work, you do it full time, and you emerge, let's call it victorious. And so, you know, it was hard for me because Perfect Keto um, was an amazing job, and I liked my role, and I liked, at first, it was an amazing job, and there were so many opportunities that it opened up for me, but I just couldn't let go of this idea that I really want to be able to, to build, to sell, to do it all. Like, you know, that's what uh, Naval will preach. So. I said, fuck it. And so October, I quit my job. I had built up a bunch of savings by traveling and living with my parents for a bit. And that's where I, that's where I started. So that was about three months ago. Um, we're now end of January, January 28th, 2021. I quit October 20th of 2020. So November, December, January, so about three months in. Um, and originally I was like, all right, I'm gonna do launch school and that's gonna be the focus. And I'm gonna build my Shopify app. And when I spoke to my boss at PK, I told him, her, everyone else, I was like, I'm gonna code, I'm gonna build a Shopify app, I'm gonna code, I'm gonna build a Shopify app. So Launch School was the big resource, um, and I started going through that. And at first, I didn't have a whole lot of momentum. I think I felt sort of adrift. I had too much time on my hands. I had no meetings, no obligations, no coworkers. And during COVID, that wasn't ideal. So at first I was a little lazy, kind of getting back into the swing of managing my own time fully again. I just used to having a job. When you have a job, you know, things come inbound and you can just kind of triage and, and execute. But when you're on your own and you're trying to go, you have to push, it's push versus pull. And pushing is much more challenging. Um, so yeah, so then I was about doing launch school, October, November, um, and then in December, I had made like multiple attempts to build my Shopify app. I even bought a course on how to build Shopify apps. Actually, it wasn't that great. Um, and I hadn't made a ton of progress. And I think looking back, you know, where my skills were and are um, and how challenging it is to build a Shopify app and get through the authentication process and understand, you know, MVC in um, Ruby, in particular Ruby on Rails, it was just a ton. I was trying to integrate with external APIs. I was trying to integrate uh, and run background jobs, which is not something that seems like a lot of Shopify apps are doing. At least, I don't know, I'm probably wrong about that, but I couldn't figure, I didn't know much about background jobs or the model view controller. Um, so I pivoted from Ruby to what's called Learn Enough. It's by this guy, Michael Hartle. It's got great reviews and it actually is a really good program. Um, so Learn Enough is all about learning just enough you know, whatever, code, HTML, CSS, JavaScript to be dangerous, like good enough to kind of make things work. So I took his Ruby on Rails course and I got about 75% of the way through, made another run at the Shopify app, got tripped up by the database this time. I don't understand Postgres. Uh, I don't know how to use, you know, a production versus test environment database. And Rails has just got a ton, ton, ton in there. Um, so then I'm like, oh, I'll use, instead of using Rails, I'll use Ruby and I'll use Sinatra. It's a much simpler framework. So I do that and then I'm trying to do my API calls and I have to worry about authentication. So I'm like, well, I don't have, you know, a way to sort of parcel the authentication. So then I'm back to Rails and I'm just like going, you know, things to things here. And a lot of this is, I know, jargon, but basically launch school, then into learn enough, um, but that really didn't get me that excited and I started kind of feeling like, you know, I think I'm reaching too far. And that's been a lesson for me that I finally learned after, you know, call it two years of coding, learning to code, is that I need to start smaller with things that I can actually go from zero to a hundred with, checking the time. Um, because otherwise I just feel really dissatisfied. Like I feel very unmotivated, like working on the Shopify app for two months straight, learning, coding, learning, coding, learning, trying to build it again and again and again. Um, and failing every time. And so I think I just, I reached too high too soon. Um, and I'm sure in the boot camps they have you do all kinds of interim projects. And I sort of learned like, oh man, like this isn't what I should be trying to build yet. Um, so a few things happened in December. I kind of started to come around to this realization. A friend of mine from the e my e-commerce days had started this Slack group. And this Slack group was all about crypto and decentralized finance. And I had worked briefly as a consultant for a crypto company like a few years ago. I've always been interested in it. And so 
um, I got into it. So I decided, like, okay, what I have, I have to do a couple things here. The Ruby stuff, I'm not sure where I'm going to take this, but I'm going to continue to learn. The DeFi stuff, the crypto and decentralized finance Slack group, it'll just be for fun, and I'll make some money doing it because you guys are, like, trading crypto all the time and stuff. So it'll be for fun, a little bit of money, the time I had no income, um, and I'm going to run with that. So I get into this crypto thing, and it's just so exciting. There's so many interesting, interesting things happening. Um, happening in DeFi from like lending protocols to borrowing protocols to farming to all kinds of crazy stuff in crypto and a lot of it you could say is like kind of off the wall but this is like frontier stuff you know it's not going to be all polished and sexy so I was kind of messing around with all these different things in crypto talking to these guys in slack um, started to actually use some of my technical ruby skills to look at the code of certain crypto coins so like there are these things called stable coins, which are supposed to be like right around the price of a dollar. Um, and you, I could look at the contract and I could actually use everything I learned from Ruby, Launch School, JavaScript, Rails to actually interpret a lot of what was happening in the code of these coins. And that was pretty amazing. And, you know, really, as I got going in the crypto Slack group, I was adding a lot of value to my peers, to the group. I was able to answer some questions. I even like wrote a primer on one of the coins. And so... I started feeling like, you know, my skills were coming to, to sort of bear. Uh, I was able to use some of these technical skills, but still like didn't quite feel that dangerous. Like I could build anything or monetize a lot of this. So then I started thinking like, man, maybe I should think about coding in the crypto universe. There's a million reasons uh, to do it. I think, you know, money is probably the most obvious, like, oh, it's going to be so lucrative, but I don't want to chase money. Um, to me, it was like, well, what's so interesting about this space and what are the values that it represents? And if you look at my Twitter profile or any of my social media profiles, you'll see that I usually put like growth, freedom or wellness, growth, freedom, something like that. Um, and those are like my values. Those, those are things that I deeply care about. And, uh, I mean, there's a number of examples, but I started thinking about coding in crypto, which is a different language. So for those of you who are technical, you know, I had now done a lot of Ruby, a little bit of Ruby on Rails, a tiny bit of JavaScript, some other basic programming. But most crypto and Ethereum in particular is written in like JavaScript style and its solidity is the language. So I started thinking about this. I'm like, hmm, maybe I should think about learning solidity. You know, maybe that would be cool um, and, and good for me and I would enjoy it more. Um, and I, so I kind of went down that path and, um, yeah, you know what happened really was like just a series of events that I felt like I wanted to listen to, I don't want to say cosmically, but you know, kind of cosmically. Um, I was working in this, or I was trying to make money off this crypto coin that had a bug. And what was so funny is like this bug was bad for everybody. Every single holder of this coin was like, oh crap, this contract has a bug. <laughs> if this bug doesn't get fixed, we're gonna lose all of our money. And people had a lot of money in this thing. But the way that that crypto coin was built and set up, and this is one of the fascinating things about decentralized anything, is that no one had the power to actually fix that bug. Not the founder of the coin, not the guy who wrote the contract, not the entire population of the people who held the coin because there was a 48 hour governance period. You had to wait 48 hours to commit any changes to the code. And it had to be voted on by the community and approved. And it was, we, we created a fix. We voted like 99% of people voted yes, because it was all good for us. But in 48 hours, the coin hyperinflated. So there was way too much supply and the price basically collapsed and the coin basically died. So think about that situation where everyone is on the same page. We all want the same thing. It's good for all of us, but we don't have control. And in fact, no one has control. And that was kind of the same week where Trump um, had already lost the election, but he basically was deplatformed across Twitter, Facebook, where Instagram, where Shopify. So like all these tech leaders, these opinionated tech leaders decided to wipe him off their platforms. AWS decided to wipe him off. AWS took down Parler and I'm like, here's the juxtaposition. It's like technology and platforms and companies and things that cannot have an opinion and can exert no control over themselves. But the constituents, like the people have the power. And even though everybody wanted the bug to be fixed, it couldn't be done. There was no overlord to exert influence or make decisions. And the opposite happened. Like the same week, 
in, in a way that I think is potentially really damaging to the concept of free speech. Um, the technology, like Twitter, for example, just decided that Trump was being inappropriate or whatever conditions they want to apply and decided that they would remove him. They can do that, but I don't think that's good long term for free speech or for, uh, you know, rational discourse or civil disagreement. Like those are things that are really important for good ideas to survive and bad ideas to die. And I can get way more into that. If you want to look, think, think about it more, I say Google Jordan Peterson. He's the freaking man on this stuff. So I had these two things battling in my mind. And what I was thinking is like, okay, I have kind of e-commerce and I have crypto. And I thought to myself, where do I feel myself more compelled to help? And it's like, I know a lot about wellness and wellness e-com and I care about the brands and supplements and like I rock, I try to be really healthy and drink, you know, my vitamins every morning. This is coffee. I don't know why I showed it to you guys. I thought it was going to be uh, something else. Anyway, uh, and I had, to, I had to weigh these value sets against each other. And I was like, as much as I care about wellness and supplements and fitness and productivity and nutrition, I love that stuff. I really do. I care about justice and freedom even more. Like those things to me matter even more. Fairness, justice, and freedom. And even for people who I disagree with, even for people who I think are criminal, even for people who I think are totally wrong, I still want them to have their say. That's part of free speech. That's part of the war of ideas in my mind. And so I align myself with how do we prevent this from happening? I don't like the fact that there's so much power consolidated uh, in humans and humans are flawed and they're going to have opinions and they're going to exert those opinions when we could have those that power held by the community and the community can decide and that's that seems like a better way to govern some of this stuff from a fairness perspective to me and i think what's going to happen in crypto so i decided to focus on crypto um, instead of focusing on ruby and rails and shopify apps and ecom so i did two things after that number one i kind of put ruby to the side Number two, I did take a consulting contract with an e-commerce business um, that makes electrolytes. I did that specifically to start bringing in some income again. Um, I wanted to start bolstering income because I was in January, I had been bleeding my savings out, and I felt like, okay, if I take this step back in terms of like my skill, like my progression, learning-wise, I'm going to spend longer learning. So I need more money to sustain that longer, that longer, you know, uh, whatever, that, that longer journey. So I started making money, so I'm doing some e-com, but just for the money really, like I don't have long-term passion about the space anymore. I mean, I do, but not to work in it. So I'm like, okay, set myself up so I can spend more time learning. And I did a couple things. I did a little JavaScript primer. I did JavaScript crash course. I did enroll in this bootcamp. So this crypto coding bootcamp, which is part-time um, called Chainshot. I'm doing it right now. So. That's where I'm at. Like that's the whole long, long, long winding journey of learning to code for me and kind of how it came to be. Um, and right now I'm focused on, okay, learn JavaScript. Okay, learn Solidity, understand Ethereum and start figuring out ways that I can build tools to promote these values. Like that's deeply what I want. I think I just have ideas of it in my head. I have nothing concrete to sort of put my finger on and say, oh, this is a project that supports my values or this is the project that could be the whatever the thing. Um, and I don't make any money in crypto yet either. So I'd like to start generating anything. You know, I could be paid in ETH or Bitcoin or whatever, but I want to start generating income from that. So we're, we're going to kind of follow the progression here, but that's the long, long winded story of how I got to where I am here today, um, where my skills are at. It's like, in beginner intermediate Ruby, beginner Rails, beginner JavaScript, uh, super beginner Solidity, but passionate about advancing these decentralized models to broader uh, platforms, uh, helping establish more fairness. And funny enough, today, and you'll, you'll probably read about this, you know, in the future, but we're going through all the GameStop and AMC war, which is basically small retail investors fighting a war against large, powerful, smart hedge funds. Um, and, and now we have like a lot of these brokerage firms deplatforming their own brokerage customers so they can't buy any more shares, only can sell, which means they're basically manipulating the price because the price can only go down if you sell. And it's bullshit, like it's total bullshit. And we shouldn't be surprised though at this point. Like we shouldn't be surprised that opinionated companies and leaders have opinions, right? They can do whatever they want. That might be illegal, that's like another thing, but like, Let's say it's not illegal for the purposes of our discussion. 
If it's not illegal, they can do whatever they want. So don't use opinionated platforms. Come to the world of non-opinionated platforms, which is crypto. So catch you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching. Cheers.